Dr. Dr. Robert Morgan comes to us from Washington University in St. Louis, where he is Professor of Engineering and Chairman of the Program in Technology and Human Affairs. We've been acquainted with programs at Washington University over a number of years. Several of our students have done uh, work in medical school there. Uh, last year, we became one of the affiliated colleges in the Engineering School in Street 2 program. Part of the rationale for affiliation with Washington University has come from their concern that that school has had for what I would describe as a broader background of in the education of engineers and in, in, in technical people. It is consistent with that concept for them to have started the program in human affairs and technology. The uh, technology and human affairs program, uh, and I quote, uh, is a response to the need for engineers who are particularly trained in public policy analysis or problem areas where the impact of technology is involved. Dr. Morgan started this program uh, at the master's level in 1971 and uh, moved into the bachelor's level with it in 1972. Last year, uh, the uh, quality and importance of that program was recognized by the Alfred Sloan Foundation with a $335,000 grant over two or three years to expand and strengthen the social dimensions of engineering. Dr. Morgan has received his PhD from Rensselaer Polytech Institute. He has taught at MIT at Rensselaer University of Missouri before joining Washington University in 1968. Besides directing the program in the Technology and Human Affairs, um, he is director of the University Center for Development Technology, uh, something which he tried to explain to me in some detail earlier this morning and which uh, somehow went by me. Uh, but it is involved in, in uh, among other things, an educational application of communication satellites uh, under working with uh, NASA. He has published a variety of papers and reports. Uh, after the uh, convocation today, uh, Dr. Morgan will be in uh, the faculty lounge and uh, available for discussion, uh, besides coffee, uh, discussion questions that you might have. He will be talking to us today on the topic technology, liberal education, and the year 2000. Bob, it's a pleasure to welcome you to our campus, and I present Dr. Robert Morgan. Thank you very much, Earl, for the very nice introduction. I found out about a month ago, or a month and a half ago, that Earl and I have something in common, and we didn't know this when, when uh, the invitation was extended, but uh, one of my closest colleagues whose office is across the, uh, the hall is Earl Alton's cousin. And uh, they haven't seen each other since they were two years old, um, which I, I think says something about our society and maybe some of our values. But uh, as I was leaving, I, I looked across the hall and I said, Les, uh, if you got a picture I could take to show to Earl so you could see what you looked like. But he didn't have one, so. Uh, that's <laughs> He's got a beard, actually, yeah, yeah, a real dark beard. I'll, I'll have to tell you about it. He's kind of gone astray, but uh, <laughs> you're recording this, are you? <laughs> Cut the excise that part. Uh, what, uh, what I want to try to do today is um, to share with you some thoughts about technology, how we're going to use it, how we're going to have to keep it from using us if we're going to make it to the year 2000. This semester, I'm teaching a course entitled Technology Survival in the Year 2000. I've got a class of about 40 students. More than half of them are freshman engineers. The first book the students read in that course was a paperback called The Limits to Growth. Some of you might have heard about it. It was written by a team of MIT researchers who used a computer to simulate the future behavior of the world. They found that if current trends continue, if current trends continue, now you have to be careful when you say current trends, because the study was done in 1972, and since 1972, some of the current trends aren't trending the way they were. <laughs> they found that if current trends continue, that is, if population, non-renewable resource consumption, industrial growth, and pollution continue to grow exponentially, the world faces a catastrophic collapse of civilization as we know it within, say, the next 100 years or so. Can this collapse be avoided? Yes, says the computer. 
not by technology alone, that is not solely by new technology for recycling non-renewable materials or new technology for limiting pollution, not by growth limiting policies alone, that is not solely by zero population growth or zero industrial growth, but by a combination of growth limiting policies and technology. How many people have, have uh, read that book, The Limits of Growth? I'm just curious, about three. Okay, that was three more than had, uh, had read the book in, in the course that I'm giving. Uh, the reaction to that book was kind of interesting. Uh, Baloney said the critics, uh, garbage in, garbage out, said one. That's, that's the old cry of the, you know, in terms of the computer stuff, garbage in, garbage out. Misplaced decimal points, said another. Um, <laughs> Technology will come to the rescue, said a third. You can't treat the whole world in one computer model, said, said a fourth, and, and so on. And, and a lot of this was true, you know, true enough. But, uh, you know, what if the computer was right? What, what if the computer was right? Uh, there's an old adage in engineering, you should try to be on the conservative side of things. And, uh, uh, well, anyway. Um, I've got two boys, 11 and 13 years old. The older one is currently doing a research paper in his junior high school course on the media. He's doing a study of disaster movies, and uh, it's kind of interesting. We, we, uh, he went to see the Towering Inferno twice, an earthquake, and, uh, and uh, maybe characters like me going around talking about books like Limits of Growth simply reflect the larger society, which flocks to see burning skyscrapers and flooded, series, uh, flooded cities in, in something called Sense Around. By the way, I read, and this is sort of technology and human affairs. I read in a paper that in a sense around business that, that they have with earthquake that uh, the noise level in some of the movies is such that it evidently can do damage to the ear. Uh, so when, they, when he went to see it, I told him to wear earmuffs or hold his hand <laughs> over, his, over his ears. Um, there's an uneasiness in the country, I think, an uncertainty about the future. According to Paul Goodman, and I quote, for 300 years, science and scientific technology had an unblemished and justified reputation as a wonderful adventure, pouring out practical benefits and liberating the spirit from the errors of superstition and traditional faith. During this century, they have finally been the only generally credited system of explanation and problem solving." End of quote. Goodman goes on to reflect the sentiment of the counterculture of the time in which he wrote, this was around 1969, 1970, when he said, yet in our generation they have come to seem to many, and to very many of the best of the young, as essentially inhuman, abstract, regimenting, hand in glove with power, and even diabolical. Goodman wrote in the strident tones of the anti-Vietnam War era of the past, in my opinion, a new feeling has emerged since then which is not so much anti-science or anti-technology, as it is a growing feeling that science and technology are limited. Limited in, what, limited in what they can do or not do. Limited in what we permit them to do. They are limited by certain natural laws, like the laws of thermodynamics, and they may have to be limited by the values and resources of the society, as was in the case of the SST. And regardless of what some people may say, Technology is used or misused by people. Decisions about how it is used or misused are made by people, which in turn reflects the values which they and the society holds. Let's take the limits to growth one step further. A new book came out last year called Mankind at the Turning Point. It was supported by the same outfit that supported the limits to growth, namely the Club of Rome. Instead of treating the world as one region, they divided it into 10 regions. This was in part responding to the criticism that you couldn't treat the whole world as one region. It in part, I think, reflects the fact that computers are just better and they can just handle a lot more information than they could uh, uh, two, three, four, five years ago. Their model very much reflects the interdependencies between regions. North America grows the food, the Middle East grows the oil, et cetera. The resources are allocated as to where they are. The results of the mankind computer runs differ from those in limits in one major regard. When the world goes to pieces in the mankind book, it goes to pieces in pieces. Regions are affected first. Given current trends, regions such as the Indian subcontinent bear the initial brunt of calamity. This should come as no surprise to anyone who's alive, reads the papers, or watches television. 
There was a major famine in West Africa, in the Sahel region of Africa in 1973. More than 400 million of the world's people are dying of starvation. Another one billion go to bed hungry every night. Half of the world's children subsist on diets that are grossly deficient in protein. The United States, which has 6% of the population of the world, consumes 30% of the resources. Large amounts of grain are consumed in this country to feed cattle to make animal protein from vegetable protein, an inefficient process. Food prices rise in the U.S. Food aid to the poorest countries declined. Food becomes an instrument of foreign policy, a way to buy oil and other resources we need to fuel our technological society. But what about the countries that have no food or fuel resources? Do we forget about the people dying of hunger and impaired by malnutrition? Do we forget about the inequities in our own country? Norman Cousins, in a recent article in the Saturday Review, provided one answer to these questions when he said, famine in India and Bangladesh is a test not just of our capacity to respond as human beings, but our, of our ability to understand the cycles of civilization. We can't ignore outstretched hands without destroying that which is most significant in the American character, a sense of vital identification with human beings wherever they are. Regarding life as the highest value is more important to the future of America than anything we make or sell. We need not be bashful in facing up to that fact and in trying to put it to work." End of quote. Perhaps the best single source of information about the world food situation that I know of is a book by Lester Brown entitled By Bread Alone. We're using it in two of our courses this semester. How easy is it to predict what the world food situation will be like in the year 2000? Not easy, says Brown, and I quote, an assessment of future food production prospects is an incredibly complex undertaking. One must at once be an agronomist, an economist, an ecologist, a meteorologist, and a political scientist to begin to understand the scope of the problem. That, that sentence, by the way, says something to me about you know, what, what kinds of things are we doing in terms of education? What kinds of, of, of students should we, be, should we be educating? What kind of students should we be turning out? This difficulty is reflected in the poor record compiled during the early 70s by those who attempted to forecast changes in a world food economy. Very few anticipated the reversal in the oceanic fish catch. As you know, the fish catch peaked about two or three years ago and is going down. The mass Soviet grain purchase in 1972 took the world almost completely by surprise. No one expected the doubling of world wheat, rice, feed grain, and soybean prices on the 1972-1974 period. The United States Department of Agriculture, with one of the finest economic analysis units available, projected a 3% annual rate of food price inflation early in 1973. The rate turned out to be closer to 20%. Few foresaw the possibility that the vast acreage of idle U.S. cropland would be called back into use within a two-year period, and even fewer foresaw that it might not suffice to overcome scarcity and return food prices to a more normal level." End of quote. It's interesting to speculate on why we do such a poor job of prediction. Maybe it's got something to do with our educational system. I don't know. I'm not sure. Even more important is the issue of what we might do about the food situation. Brown has some prescriptions for this. Greatly increased efforts to reduce birth rates through family planning. Simplification of diets among the affluent. Shifting from animal to vegetable protein could free up large amounts of grain. Establishment of a world food reserve. Greatly increased efforts and resources to shore up food production in needy countries. Developing such policies will take leadership and a recognition of the moral dimension. As Willie Brandt put it, morally it makes no difference whether a man is killed in war or is condemned to starve to death by the indifference of others. Some of you may know that uh, on April 17th, there's uh, something called Food Day that's going to be <coughs> held on college campuses. Uh, um, you recall uh, three or four years ago, they had Earth Day. And the Food Day is an attempt to uh, educate the public and to provide a focus for concern about both the world food situation and food situation in the U.S. I, I don't know if anything's planned for... for uh, Augsburg or for the, some of the local colleges. Uh, there is a Minneapolis coordinator. I'm looking through, through their, their newsletter. 
Well, as we approach the 200th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, the United States faces difficult and crucial decisions concerning food policy, energy policy, environmental policy, decisions concerning relations among nations. Science and technology appear to be limited in what they can do and cannot do. Resources are finite. In such a situation, decisions concerning how scientific and technological expertise and resources are to be used become extremely important. We don't have unlimited financial resources to support every new military weapon that comes along. People make decisions about what programs to support and what not to support. At the federal level, the Congress and the executive branch make such decisions. Similar decisions are made at the state and local levels. What kind of preparation do we expect these people, the decision makers, to have? What kind of technical knowledge input should go into such a process? What are our educational institutions preparing individuals to do? What kinds of knowledge must citizens have to survive in the society as we know it? In the remainder of this talk, I'd like to touch upon some ideas concerning the education of individuals, which might blend technological awareness with a concern for the human condition. I went to a small college in New York City called Cooper Union. It was founded by Peter Cooper, an inventor and a philanthropist who was probably best known for his locomotive, the Tom Thumb. I received a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering in 1956. The education that I received in those American graffiti security-seeking years mixed a series of technical courses on one hand with the required numbers of humanities and social science courses on the other. Mixed is probably not the right word because the two, the technical on one hand and the humanities and social science on the other, never really seemed to relate to each other. Had I chosen to continue to be a chemical engineer, I could today be working for an oil company designing a distillation tower or trying to come up with a new technique useful in the gasification of coal or in the removal of sulfur dioxide. I don't say this to knock it. Society needs well-trained engineers and scientists who know their stuff. Engineering has been picking up steam again after the kind of anti-technology hiatus of the late 1960s. The jobs are there, or at least they were, and enrollments are up. But the world has also changed since the 1950s. It has become apparent that technology permeates everything we do and is involved in everything we might want to do in the future. There are a sizable number of individuals with scientific training or inclinations. Some of them, like myself, for whatever crazy reason, were not content to sit at a desk and crank out numbers without knowing the big picture. We wanted to see if we could relate what we knew and did to some real world problems. We wanted to see if we could get away from the engineer's ancient dilemma of being a little cog in a big machine and to try to move the profession towards more of a kind of personal reward. And I don't mean necessarily financial, although I don't, I don't dis discount that either. I don't knock that either. Toward the kind of personal reward that, say, a physician gets when she or he cures a patient. There are two streams which permeate the technology and human affairs program at Washington University, one of which I might characterize as the technology do-good stream, and the other the technology assessment stream. The first stream, the technology do-good stream, is probably the toughest of the two to pull off. The premise is that if you take some people with scientific and technical training, point them at some real problems, like reducing pollution, or getting energy from the sun, or doing housing rehabilitation cheaper, or improving agricultural productivity overseas, you'll be able to make some contributions. You'll note the old problem-solving engineering mentality here, you know, namely that if we can put a man on the moon, we can... You know. Clearly, this is easier said than done, but I would contend that nobody's really tried to do it. Just look at the budgets. We do miracles in a weaponry field, but we spend $100 billion a year and 10 to $20 billion a year of it on research and development. The research and development budgets for the kinds of things I mentioned are much smaller if you look at them. When I lived in Troy, New York, I became involved in an organization called VITA, Volunteers for International Technical Assistance. Since 1960, 
VITA has grown into a worldwide organization of scientists, engineers, and others who donate their services to try to aid those working in less developed areas, both in the rest of the world and in our own country. Back in the 1960s, we had something called the Peace Corps, as we still do. Many of the volunteers had little in the way of technical skills and training. VITA served as kind of a mail order answering service for Peace Corps and foreign nationals and others who had specific technical problems. It was through that involvement with VITA that I got personally involved in what I'm doing now. Just to give you an idea of the resource flows here, in the early days, the people who started VITA wanted to get some feel for whether there really was a need for some kind of service in the technical assistance area. So they computed up, they got a hold of the UN budgets and the other budgets, and they computed up worldwide budgets for technical assistance to less developed countries. And they found that the total amount of money being spent in 1960 was less than the General Electric Company payroll in Schenectady for that year. I guess what I'm trying to say is that I think it's worth trying to find ways to apply technology to help improve the standard of living and quality of life for people in a direct and meaningful way. It's not easy to do, but we haven't really tried. Different people and different schools try different ways. We have one project going now at our university through this Center for Development Technology that, that Earl didn't understand and I don't understand sometimes myself either in which we're trying, along with a private research organization, to develop better roofing materials for tropical areas. A colleague of mine, Rudd Falconer, who's an architect, spends a fair amount of time these days traveling around the world, getting intimately acquainted with problems of housing in countries such as Jamaica, the Philippines, and Zambia. Many indigenous roofing materials and structures have a lot of merit in rural areas. They are inexpensive to build, and oftentimes the more primitive solution has a lot of technical merit. However, they have their limitations. Many imported materials, on the other hand, tend to be expensive and weren't de designed for use in the tropics in the first place. A house costing $300 may not seem expensive to you, but in Bangladesh it's three times the annual income of individuals. In many areas, only self-help techniques appear to have the potential for meeting housing needs. Whether through our efforts we can come up with new materials and techniques which fit the economic and environmental constraints remains to be seen, but we're in the process of giving it a try. We're also involved in another project in which we're examining ways in which Earth observation satellite systems might provide useful information at the state and local level in fields such as agriculture, environmental monitoring, land use planning, and mineral discovery. In the last couple of years, the Earth's One satellite has provided scientific data to some 300 researchers. The question we are interested in is more mundane. Can the data from Earth's, I guess they changed the name, it's Landsat now, to give it more, more glamour. Uh, can the data from Landsat or an improved version of Landsat be of value in the day-to-day -day operations of state, local, and regional agencies? What kinds of data do they really need? Is there a match here between the technology on one hand and the user's need on the other? What about the potential of such, such technology in less developed countries for providing improved agricultural and mineral information? How should an international system to disseminate such data evolve? keeping in mind that, that knowledge is power here. Well, we're interested in high technologies, we're interested in low technologies, big technologies, little technologies, resource conserving and ecologically sound technologies. But mostly we're interested in what the technology can do to help improve the human condition, not the technology for technology's sake. And here again, in our own situation, we try very much to focus around the student's interest. We don't say, you know, here's some technology you ought to look at. A lot of times it comes from the interests of, of individual students. The other stream I mentioned is the technology assessment stream. Technology assessment is a term which emerged in the late 1960s and was given more substance a year or so ago when the Office of Technology Assessment was created by the Congress to provide information to the Congress concerning technological development. What you try to do in a technology assessment is to analyze all the ramifications of a particular technological development, 
not just whether it makes technical or economic sense, but its social or environmental implications as well. Perhaps the most famous technology assessment was the one done on the SST. This was done long before Congress established the Office of Technology Assessment. Some other projects <clears throat> that the OTA, this congressional office, is now working on, and they're reported to be nearing completion of their studies, deal with automated train control, aircraft crash recorders, solar energy, and food information systems. The National Science Foundation has sponsored technology assessments of snowpack, cloud seeding, and the Colorado River. And they've also sponsored an assessment of energy under the oceans, dealing with uh, outer continental shelf oil and gas operations. Just giving the titles doesn't give a flavor of what these studies are like. <clears throat> but if they're going to be useful, in my opinion, they have to provide insight in understandable terms, in terms that people can deal with. This, this business of the technological jargon just doesn't go in these kinds of studies. You can't just talk to other scientists and engineers. You've got to talk to everybody. So these studies are going to have to provide uh, insights in understandable language as to what the effects of the developments might be, what their environmental implications are, what their social implications are going to be. Clearly, the outcome of these technology assessments, at least in my opinion it's clear, will be influenced to some extent by the methods employed and the makeup of the study teams. We may argue about whether science is or isn't neutral, but this is more than just science. Well, not, I shouldn't say just. This is different than science. Methodologies are evolving for performing some assessments. And one of the problems in this area, and one of the things I'm fighting, is that, you know, you say something, technology assessment and methodology comes and people figure out, they lay out matrices and impact analyses and everything else. And before you know it, you have a whole jargon evolving again. And I think one of the real challenges, the way I see it in this area, is to keep it understandable. Methodologies are evolving for performing these assessments, but the human element is very important here. In a technology assessment, there's an element of trying to prevent or anticipate misuse of technology, of having an early warning system to alert society to possible dangers that may arise from a particular stream of development. An assessment might end by laying out the alternatives policymakers might follow and listing the pros and cons. Universities are in a uh, peculiar kind of a crack, at least those that, that undertake some of these studies under, under uh, sponsorship, under external funding. What they, the approach they usually try to take is they look at a particular problem and they lay out the alternatives and they say, well, you, could, you have this policy option, you have this policy option, you can do this or this. And if you do this, the consequences might be thus and so. And uh, it'll be interesting to see what kind of reactions you get from congressmen and lawmakers to that approach because uh, uh, sometimes people like to be told, you know, what's the best thing to do? What's the best thing to do? And the universities, uh, a lot of them are probably not going to tell the congressman the best thing to do. They're just going to say, okay, you know, here's, here are the alternatives. You're the elected official. You decide. You pick. You know, that's your decision. And I think this is related to the question of just, just, just what are the roles of, of, of people in academia here and how, how do you best go about structuring this kind of information. Another important development which relates to technology assessment is the National Environmental Protection Act, NEPA, which requires that environmental impact statements be written for federally funded projects. Although NEPA was bypassed once in the case of the Alaska pipeline, it's keeping a lot of people busy. It's also um, requiring that companies think about the kinds of individuals that they employ. Well, I guess what I'm trying to say here is that this environmental impact statement area is one that, that's creating the demand for individuals who have some broader skills than, than are normally found in, in some organizations. Well, let me talk a little bit specifically about the, uh, the degree programs we've been evolving in our technology and human affairs program and try and try to relate this to the to the theme of your convocation series namely values in liberal education uh, and then I think uh, that'll leave a good 
15 or 10 or 15 minutes for, for questions. At the master's degree level, we offer either the MA or the MS degree in technology and human affairs, depending upon the background of the students. We consider the master's degree to be a professional degree. Not, it's not a professional engineering degree. They're not engineers. But it's a professional degree in, a, in, a, in an evolving, still-to-be-defined profession. People enter the master's degree program, people who enter have a bachelor's degree in something, engineering, physics, biology, chemistry, political science, economics, something. We broaden them, or we narrow them, get them problem-oriented, teach some skills, technology assessment skills, forecasting, and boot them out into the world. At the bachelor's level, things are not that nicely defined. There are certain math, science, and engineering requirements which give the program its distinctiveness. But what are we trying to do? What has it got to do with what we might call a liberal technological education? Let me try to answer that by setting forth my personal views and hopes on what I'd like to see our students take with them when they graduate. First, I'd like them to have received what I might call a holistic education. I want them to see the big picture. Not a series of course fragments, but something that really hangs together. A view of how technology relates to society and vice, vice versa. Many curricula, many curricula don't do this. At least this was my experience. Uh, I don't want to single out any one or, or, or any other. Um, and I don't, uh, well, I, I guess in, in, the conventional, in the conventional engineering course, for example, or in many engineering courses, you have a textbook and you have chapters and there's a set of problems at the end of the chapters and you go through and you, you solve the problems. And, uh, you know, that's, that's fine and that's important and if you, if you learn how to solve the problems right, bridges won't fall down and other things like that that are very important won't happen. But, but on the other hand, uh, I think something more than that's needed. It's not necessarily needed in every individual, but it's needed in the spectrum of skills that we have available to us as a society. And I want, I want to see some people coming out who have the big picture of how technology relates to what people do and how it relates to society. And you would be amazed at how few places up till now have really taken that particular approach, although it's beginning to happen. It's beginning to happen. Second, I would like for, for our graduates to be literate and articulate, to be able to express themselves, to be capable of understanding scientific and technological ideas, and to communicate these ideas to the public, to people, not just to other scientists or technologies technologists. Again, I think we haven't, colleges and universities haven't really done our job here in, in, in that particular respect. Uh, and I hope that we can, we can do something about this. And the way we go it, we, the way we go out this is we make them write a lot. We make them write a lot. We make them make videotapes or audio tapes. We make them go talk to people. We make them do projects that they have to de defend be before people outside of the university. So that's, I think, an important aspect. Third, I would like for them to understand how the system works, how the U.S. and the global system works, and in particular, how science and technology policy are made, how decisions concerning research and development priorities are made, and how could they plug in, how could they become a part of that particular process, the decision-making process. Fourth, I would like for them to acquire some degree of understanding of a particular problem or issue area, such as energy or the environment or the food situation. Programs should hang together around some problem or issue thread. And a lot of time this evolves from the interests of the particular student. Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, one of our, I, I, it's, you know, you always talk about your good examples. You, you, you don't talk about the others. Uh, we had a student who had a bachelor's degree in biology from uh, uh, college uh, who had, I don't know, had about a 3.4 out of a 4.0, which isn't bad. Couldn't get into medical school with a 3.4 out of 4.0. 
uh, came to the master's degree program in technology and human affairs, knew he was interested in health care delivery. Knew he was interested in health care delivery. Uh, we did not at that time have a structured program dealing with health care delivery. He spent the first two weeks at the university running around. He talked to people in medical school. He talked to people in engineering school. He talked to people in sociology. He talked to people in economics. We have a health care administration program. He talked to people there. Came out, came into me. He had a set of eight courses worked out, all related to health care, health care delivery, course in biomedical engineering, course in some other things. Uh, completed the coursework. He did a master's thesis in which he looked at what's happening in the field of telemedicine. By telemedicine, I mean uh, the area in which there are beginning to be experiments and demonstrations and uses of two-way television for remote diagnosis of patients. Did a master's thesis in this area, evaluated some of the projects that are going on, looked at some of the legal aspects, some of the social aspects, made some recommendations about what needed to be done in the future in terms of new regulation, new legislation, et cetera. Um, did a very nice job, is now, got admitted to medical school, uh, State University of New York in Buffalo, and he's spending the summer this summer with the World Health Organization in Geneva working on telemedicine projects. Uh, as I say, that's, you know, I got some other stories, but, <laughs> you know, you always put the, put the best foot, foot forward. That, well, I say this to illustrate that I like people to develop some understanding of a particular problem or issue area, and in this case, it was the healthcare delivery area. Finally, we would like our students to acquire certain skills, but actually, I'd like to see them I'd like wherever possible for them to see the rationale, why they need to develop those particular skills. I'll give you an example, a bad example of uh, what I think is a bad example. I took six, six thermodynamics courses while acquiring four degrees. Uh, you know, I took some undergraduate ones, I took some graduate ones, and I don't really know the subject too well. I mean, I know, I know, I know something about it, but I took six courses. And uh, when I was taking those courses, it wasn't never really clear to me what I was going to do with that stuff. And we've got a situation that sort of works in the reverse. We had a student who came in one day, and as a result of a very strong interest in solar energy, and he was trying to, student, students have this tremendous desire to build solar collectors. They, they all want to build solar collectors. But this fellow was very much interested in solar energy, and uh, was trying to understand what was going on in this collector and trying to understand what the, what the uh, relationships were and where the heat was going and everything else. And he came in and he decided he had to have a thermodynamics course. And it seems to me that's a much better rationale. And in one course, he probably learned as much as I did in six. So what I'm saying is our people have to have certain skills, but, but by working in the problem fo focus along with the skills focus, I think they'll see more of a rationale for it. And uh, wherever possible, we try to, to develop that. One question that always comes up is, well, if you get this kind of education, what are you going to do with it? You know, uh, what, do you, what do you do for a living? And uh, I guess we've, we've thought of three answers to that. The first is relax, you know, enjoy it, and the chalk it up to getting what we might call a liberal technological education. Learn what you can while you can. Worry about the real world later. The problem with this scenario is that the doing this usually requires an abundance of self-confidence and money. <laughs> uh, second thing you can do with it is to use it to go on to bigger and better things in education. Law school, medical school, graduate school. We have a number of people who, who have done this. The third thing you can do with this kind of education, hopefully, is get a job. This is easier said than done nowadays. What have you got to sell? Well, you're not an engineer, but maybe you're somewhat engineering related. You've had some experience with real world problems while in school, and you've got a jazzy title going for you that no one understands. So, uh, well, just to, uh, to conclude, and uh, Maybe, maybe uh, I don't know whether th this is good or bad, but if, but if I were starting out again, I'd want this kind of education, the kind I've described. 
one that combines science, math, and life, and one that might lead to working at something like the Center for Science and the Public Interest, or to some congressional staff, or to some progressive company that wasn't afraid to gamble a little. But there's an old adage which says, them that can do, and them that can't teach. I teach about it, and I talk about it, and you are the ones who are going to have to do it. Thank you. I'm sure that Dr. Morgan would like to address himself any questions that you might have. Yeah. Uh, just a technical question. Sure. Uh, currently, uh, what sort of enrollment do you have in, the, in the program that you're talking about here? Uh, How many people would you graduate, for example, with a master's degree in this area? Yeah, we have, at the, at the master's degree level, um, the numbers have been relatively small since the program started. We generally run uh, between five and ten master's degree students per year. Now that situation is about to change. We have over 40 applicants for next fall, um, which was a factor of four larger than we've had in the past. So I would guess uh, next fall at the master's level we have uh, you know, 10 or 15, somewhere in that ballpark. We're, we're dreaming all kind of crazy dreams now. Harold doesn't know about this yet, but uh, but we're thinking about a PhD program very seriously and some other things. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, do you find that a, a greater hosp uh, hospitality or uh, among companies uh, today with this kind of uh, uh, background than you would have found, uh, say, a few years ago? Oh yeah, I think I think so. Um, uh, in all in all honesty, we we have not um, up until a year ago when we got the Sloan grant, um, we were really running on a shoestring. I mean, we were we were running ourselves to a frazzle, and we didn't have a chance really to do all that we might have done. And part of what we might have done was would be a lot more cultivation of 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 possible job job prospects. But I think um, I've seen over the last uh, over the last year or so ads are beginning to appear for public policy analysts, uh, technology evaluation, um, social environmental impact analysis, environmental planning, and they're coming out of you know con ed and various kinds of places. Um, so I think there is more receptivity. Also, it's a question of, of, of these kinds of programs beginning to get themselves a little more established. Ours is not the only one, and they're beginning. So I think it'll take a little while, but I think it'll, I think it'll happen. At least I, I hope it'll happen. And many of, and, and you know, it's, it's, I, I realize this is important. I, I don't knock it. I realize that it's important, but but what, what, what we find happening is that a pretty good percentage of the students we get are students that have very clear ideas of what they want to do and who are just going to do it and are trying to find a place to do it and who are going to kind of make their own way. We get a fair amount of this, too. Yes? You, excuse me, I, I uh, like most of what you said. Uh, you mentioned uh, at the closing certain certain aspects of the program that you wanted the students to have, uh, certain things you wanted them to acquire. Last on the list was skills. Uh, could you talk a little more about that? Sure. That's right, you know, but that's the lowest priority. Yeah, okay, that's 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 a good point. Um, <coughs> the well, take, as I say, take this technology assessment business, which I think is a good example. Um, there, are, there are certain techniques that are used in performing technology assessments that, that you just don't you know, pick up off the street. And those are the kinds of things we try to teach. There are certain things 
dealing with forecasting, uh, technology forecasting. There are certain kinds of, of methods of public policy analysis and decision analysis that require certain kinds of formal training. So these are the kinds of things that, that we find ourselves getting into. Also, you see at the master's level, students already have some skills. I mean, they got a bachelor's degree in biology, they have a bachelor's degree in chemistry or math and physics. They've got, they've got some, 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 some skills to begin with. So um, I, didn't, I, didn't, I didn't mean it to, to put it at a, at a lower level. And I think one of the things we're finding, one of the things we're finding is that we've got to rethink this area, and we've got to rethink what our unique niche is going to be. For example, um, and we learn, by, we learn by doing. We've had some discussions with people, for example, at Argonne National Lab. Argonne National Lab ran a big ad that sounded like it was right down our alley. And we went and we talked to the people in Argonne, and we found out that one skill that was very important to them was simulation, computer simulation. And we now feel that there's a very strong need in our program to develop a sequence that does kind of this world modeling, food prediction, other kind of simulation. Is that a response? Bob, you might want to comment about what's happened at the bachelor's degree level in preserving a few of our people interested in engineering uh, that would otherwise have been lost to us. I think that's a, an interesting aspect. Yeah, well, we do, uh, we do have a bachelor's degree program, and uh, I guess um, what, what uh, Dean Brown, this is Harold Brown, who's our uh, assistant dean of the School of Engineering at Washington University, who's keeping an eye on me. No, I'm just <laughs> kidding, Harold. And, uh, I guess what happened was that we, we found that there were uh, a small number of students, not too many, but there were a small number of students in the School of Engineering who just felt that the conventional engineering program was not for them. And uh, the Technology and Human Affairs program gave them an outlet for some of their interests in doing some things which uh, enabled, from the point of view of the, from the selfish point of view of the School of Engineering, it, it enabled them to hold on to those students and yet give them a program that, that made sense to them. But many of them came out with engineering degrees. Sure, sure. One, one combination that I really think is, uh, is uh, really a, a winner in every respect, um, you know, job-wise, security-wise, conceptually, in every other way, is a situation in which a student uh, would get a, uh, um, a degree in engineering plus some kind of relationship with our program. That, I think, is, is solidly based. And I also think a program in which uh, there's a strong natural science degree plus some of our activities is a good one also. We have a little more difficult time with people who have social science backgrounds in terms of job. Yes? Uh, in terms of uh, your personal view of things, you mentioned a moment ago, uh, holistic uh, education. Uh, do you find uh, that you'd be able to, so to speak, predicate this of, of your graduates? And, uh, and if you uh, are, is this uh, uh, you contribute significantly to this uh, education, or is it in part something uh, uh, which you, uh, which the uh, people who come to you bring with them? I don't think that it's bad if they should. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, and, yes, I think I think the the program is structured to provide this kind of view, what, what we're, see, I think these are two very good questions because the dilemma we face is what kind of balance do we set, do we find between the holistic view and the skills? That's really the, the central core of our dilemma. What kind of balance do we, do we strike there? But, uh, uh, of course, we you see, and we did start off more with the holistic type courses, and now we're beginning to think more about the, about the skills kinds of courses. 
and, and how to blend the two. But, uh, you know, you read a book like the one I mentioned by Brett alone, uh, you, you know, you require that in a course, and you read that book and you discuss it and you talk about it, and uh, you, 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 uh, you come away with that view. Now, as far as what the students bring with them when they come in, one of the really interesting things about this program that I find is that uh, no two students, no two students are at all alike. They're, they're all individuals. They've got their own ideas. They, 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 uh, their objectives in general are different. And uh, there's a tremendous diversity in terms of background and outlook. One of the things we're finding is that, uh, at least in, our, in the people who are applying for the master's degree program, uh, we've always had a big spike in the natural sciences, but we're beginning to get we're beginning to get people who are coming out of some of these crazy kind of programs at the undergraduate level. You know, there are you know, science, technology, and society programs that are beginning to spawn at the undergraduate level. So uh, they some of them some of them will come in. They'll they'll be uh, straight engineers. And, uh, comment on what you think are the minimal requirements and what you particularly look for for the person that's going to go in the engineering school? Well, the, the minimal requirements are uh, pretty minimal. Actually, uh, the catalog for the, I'm talking about the master's degree program, the, the catalog says uh, they have to have a year of a math course a year of math sequence, and they have to have a year of a uh, of a social science, and they have to have a year of a natural science. It gets some of my colleagues really upset that we don't specify which natural science. Some of them think that if they don't have physics, it's the end of the world. But uh, we managed to sneak that through, and uh, <laughs> You don't, you don't appreciate how getting this program started in the School of Engineering, what a political challenge that is. <laughs> but, um, and then we say, we, we say that uh, a, a course in economics and in statistics and in computer programming would be very helpful and is strongly recommended. And then we also say it's, it's uh, recommended that students come very confident and capable of their writing skills. That's, that's kind of what we say. It depends on the major. The major. That there must be a major in one of the areas. Uh, you mentioned it earlier. But well, in well they have to have a bachelor's degree in something. Yeah, they have to have a bachelor's degree in something. But what, but what I'm degree. saying, see, we haven't got this straightened out between ourselves yet. But, <laughs> but what I'm saying is that some of them are coming up with, with these crazy mixed up programs at the undergraduate level now. But you are looking for majors in science. Not oh, yeah. 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 There was another question. Yeah. Oh, the uh, program seems to have been born in a desire to deal with problems <coughs> that exist in civilization on a scale that is quite different than the past problems of transcend all sorts of disciplines and therefore you're trying to uh, bring up onto the next generation a larger a number of, of generalists who do have some sort of skill and the program then seems to me to be uh, having them born of is our deal with problems, the problem oriented and you're dealing with the problems of man and uh, I'm wondering to what extent in your holistic approach you really come to grips with the, uh, with just the nature of man per se, not just the nature of man's problems, but the nature of man. Uh, following the success of Isaac Newton uh, and, and, and uh, physics, he introduced the, uh, all of social science, it seems, so flocked to uh, that uh, the Newtonian view, uh, mechanistic view of man, and uh, we seem to presume that that uh, technical solutions uh, uh, will, will be the solution. We presume that uh, behavioral control, the techniques of behavioral uh, control, will uh, be the techniques that we have to use in some way. And yet there are there are many that argue that. This is uh, what 
broken image. Yeah. Oh, I'm wondering if your program does go into war. Okay. Just the nature of man, not so much the yeah. problem. All right. Let, let me let me uh, first make a comment and then try to respond to the to the question. You mentioned that we're trying to turn out generalists. Um, maybe yes and maybe no. I guess my feeling is that that you know today's generalist is tomorrow specialist, and I see I see specialties laid out a certain way. You know, I see biology, I see chemistry, and I see chemical engineering, I see electrical engineering. Sociology and those are specialties, and and I don't see why you can't have specialties in food and specialties in energy and specialties in environment and specialties in in things that are, you know, maybe maybe directed in in little different ways than specialties are are now. Now, so I guess I guess my feeling is that that. There's this aspect of what we're doing. We're 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 getting people a little more, a little a little oriented away from in which which it's been traditional in the past. Your 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 comment about the the issue of uh, of values and views views of the human condition, et cetera, is is. Um, is I think very pertinent here. I think you've put your finger on probably one of the major weaknesses we have. We have not emphasized to any great extent the kinds of issues that you brought up. We have one course at the sophomore level entitled Technology, Values, and Responsibilities, which gets into this realm to some extent and um, but I, I, and I think to some extent it reflects the fact that the program was created by what I would describe as kind of do-good engineers who have been trying to reach out to the rest of the university. In a number of universities it starts the other way. It starts over in philosophy or it starts over in the social sciences and then it reaches out. The only problem with that is that they usually reach out to the point where they miss engineering com and completely. So uh, this is a real weakness. There are some programs. The National Endowment for the Humanities has been funding some programs which, which focus directly on that, on that issue. As a matter of fact, uh, I learned about a conference coming up at Lehigh. Lehigh has a, a major program that deals with the interrelationship between technology and values. And th that really hasn't been our, our area of emphasis, although we have the resources, I think. And given the time and given the, uh, the, 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 the will, I think we can, we can do more than we've done. I see it's coming to the end of the conversation hour anyway. Uh, Dr. Morgan, thank you very much for being with us today. Enjoyed your address. Thank you. Thank you.